Chapter 24, Concepts of Care for Patients with Non-Infectious Lower Respiratory Conditions. We'll begin by talking about COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It begins on page 541 of your text. Um, for pathophysiology review of COPD, I'm going to refer you back to your figure on page 541 of your text. COPD includes um, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So in chronic bronchitis, this is an airway problem. So either infection or bronchial irritants has caused increased secretions, edema, bronchospasms, and then impaired mucus clearance within the bronchioles. Um, inflammation of the bronchial walls has led them to thicken. Then the thickening together with the excessive mucus clots the airways and hinders gas exchange. So chronic bronchitis, think airway problem, bronchial problem. In emphysema, this is an alveolar problem. So there is collapse of the bronchioles and alveolar air sacs. So as these collapse occurs, um, there is a transition from the elastic structures that we know have great um, air exchange um, with increased surface area to inelastic alveolar structures with poor air exchange. So therefore, air is going to become trapped. You're going to have hyperinflammation of the lungs, so this leads to that barrel chest presentation of your COPD patient. The stagnant trapped air is then going to impair your oxygen supply. COPD risk factors, cigarette smoking is the greatest risk factor. There is an association of a genetic deficiency, very widespread, 15.7 million in the U.S. affected. Um, in regards to a modifiable risk factor, which here is the cigarette smoking, um, we believe the inhaled smoke triggers the release of excessive um, enzymes in the lungs. These enzymes then break down elastin. This is a major component that makes the elastivity of the alveoli. Um, by impairing the action of cilia then, you also have smoking increases the risk of inability to clear the bronchioles. So that's where it kind of triggers um, or um, contributes to the presentation of the chronic bronchitis and emphysema. In the healthy lung, these enzymes would help destroy and eliminate particles and held during breathing. And so with, with your cigarette smoking triggering this, um, the increased synthesis of these enzymes higher than normal levels, we then get damage to the alveoli um, and breakdown of the elastin. So over time, the alveolar sacs lose their elasticity. Um, the small airways collapse or narrow and we get these large um, alveoli that are not elastic and do, are not efficient in gas exchange. This is with all diseases. We have to focus in on the complications of COPD, hypoxia, acidosis, um, increased risk for respiratory infections, cardiac failure, which we'll come back to, um, increased risk for dysarrhythmias, and respiratory failure. So cardiac um, chordae pulmonae, so this is right-sided heart failure caused by pulmonary disease. Again, this is consistent um, due to the bronchitis and emphysema pathophysiology of COPD. The air trapping, airway collapse, stiffening of alveolar walls, increases lung tissue pressure, narrows um, lung blood vessels, making blood flow more difficult. This increased pressure is going to make heavier workflow for the right side of the heart because this is um, the side of the heart that pumps blood in into the lungs. So to pump blood through these narrowed vessels, the right side of the heart is going to experience higher pressures and have to overcome that pressure, um, increase its workload. So the right side chambers of the heart enlarge, they thicken. You think, well, that makes for a stronger heart muscle. Actually, that impairs its function. That's going to lead to heart, right-sided heart failure. You're going to have backup of blood then into the general venous system we'll talk about in our cardiac modules. Coming up, the differentiation of right and left-sided heart failure. You need to know the key features box um, of right-sided heart failure um, that's in page 550 of your text, um, focusing in on how your patient will present. They'll typically have distended neck veins and dependent edemia. Cardiac dysrhythmias in your patient, this usually comes from your heart muscle, coronary arteries, um, not supplying enough oxygen, resulting in hypoxia. 
Your patient with COPD is usually thin, um, loss of muscle mass and extremities. This has a lot to do with um, appetite being impaired by ability to breathe. Um, they find it difficult to enjoy a meal due to hypoxemia and then their expenditure of calories is also higher in the setting of this respiratory condition. Usually they're slow moving, slightly slooped over. You may find your patient here as demonstrated in the image in this forward bending position with arms held forward. Um, this is a position known as the tripod position. Um, if you find your patient tripod positioning, it's important for you to know um, um, in this position, they're usually using accessory muscles to breathe, so therefore they are demonstrating signs of respiratory um, distress. You must prioritize their care. This is not showing adequate um, gas exchange when you find your patient um, in tripod positioning. They may have rapid shallow respirations and abnormal breathing pattern in which the abdominal wall is sucked in during expiration and again the use of these accessory muscles in their abdomen and neck. Also important that you assess your patient's um, degree of shortness of breath. This is 504 of your text. There's a chart there. Um, we will also talk about it in relation to heart failure. Assessment of their degree of dyspnea. So asking them, is it the flight of stairs? How far can you walk? What in your daily life are you unable to do um, due to shortness of breath? Have you seen a regression? Have you seen you could climb the flight of stairs without taking a break? Then it was, I had to take multiple breaks and now I can't even climb the flight of stairs. That's going to help you advocate for the progression of the disease, but also interventions they may need and home health care. Um, that may, they may need. Your patient may have the um, figure 24.6, which is this barrel chest. This is again due to, this is a part of the emphysema, the lung overinflammation, and the flattening of the diaphragm. You want to assess for cyanosis, a late indicator of hypoxia, delayed cap refill, finger clubbing, that's in figure 24.7. Um, this is chronic. So when you See finger clubbing, this is indications of chronically um, decreased arterial oxygen levels to the extremities. Assessing for heart rate and rhythm because we know a complication of the hypoxia is cardiac dysrhythmias and then swelling for their hands and feet, distant neck vessels, letting us know there's indications of right-sided heart failure due to COPD. Here's a screenshot of your table from page 504 assessing that degree of dyspnea. You see the different classes here, one, two, three, four, and five. And then looking, let's see, more specifically on the ADL keys, you'll see as they progress in the stages of dyspnea, um, your patient may have incomplete performance of ADLs and assistance is necessary at stage four. So again, seeing um, that at times prior to these stages, they're able to complete the activity either even with stopping and then returning. But by stage four, we now require assistance at home because of incompletion of these tasks even with rest. You want to ask your patient again um, about the severity. Um, does it occur after walking one block, climbing a flight of stairs, um, helping them classify it based on an ADL or activity that they perform? This is that good indicator um, of life-threatening illness, helps us optimize their care, um, advocate for improvement in symptom management and resources they may need at home. Now let's talk about some imaging studies in COPD. Um, as the disease worsens, we said we lose our oxygen in our blood. Hypoxemia, the amount of carbon dioxide, oxygen retention is increasing. That's hypercapnia. Um, chronic respiratory acidosis. So you're going to see an increase in your arterial CO2 on your blood gas. Um, typically, you then will see a metabolic alkalosis, and this is trying to offset the respiratory acidosis, trying to compensate here by um, retention, kidney retention of bicarb. Not all patients with COPD um, can be classified as CO2 retainers. Um, even when you note hypoxia is present. The reason for this is CO2 does more easily um, diffuse across muscle membranes than does oxygen. So hypercapnia is often chronically present in advanced emphysema 
because this is the alveolar um, impairment, um, rather than your bron chronic bronchitis, because this is an airway disease. So if your patient suffers more with a pathophysiology that is in impacting the bronchioles versus the alveoli, um, they're likely not going to be um, evidence of CO2 retainers for them. COPD is classified um, from mild to very severe on the basis of symptoms and their um, function P PFTs, their pulmonary function test. Um, there's a gold standard um, treatment strategy for COPD um, based on these for providers that talks about when to implement what um, type of management for them. Prioritization of um, care is going to be um, around decreased gas exchange, weight loss, fatigue, and the potential for infection, including respiratory infections such as pneumonia. Um, weight loss, again, usually due to dyspnea, excessive secretions, anorexia, fatigue, um, a lot of anxiety around the progression of this disease, changes in their health, um, situational crisis, barriers to care. Um, decreased endurance due to fatigue, shortness of breath, and imbalance between this oxygen supply and demand is going to impact every aspect of their health. So now let's talk about some interventions to aid in improving gas exchange with some different breathing techniques. Um, some abdominal and purse lip breathing may be helpful for managing um, dyspnea episodes, teaching them how to use these techniques. Um, there is um, education for your patient and family members preparing for self-management breathing exercise box on page um, 554. Controlled coughing is awful, also helpful and this is to eliminate excessive mucus. Your patient with COPD may need oxygen two to four liters via nasal cannula or up to 40 percent via venturi mask. All, all hypoxic patients, so even those that are demonstrating um, hypercapnia should receive oxygen therapy at rates appropriate to reduce hypoxia um, with goal of bringing their PaO2 to the, their baseline are usually between 88 and 92 percent. Um, Evidence-based research does show us that pulmonary rehab, just as cardiac rehab, can help improve function endurance in patients with COPD, so advocating for them to enroll um, in those resources in their community. Maintaining adequate hydration is so important. Um, for those of you in clinical with me, we've um, administered Mucinex before for our patients with respiratory infections and in our COPD patients. Um, but these um, medications are not effective if the patient is dehydrated and not maintaining adequate hydration. We need the hydration to help thin out the secretions and then um, making it easier to remove these by effective coughing. Okay, so unless hydration needs to be avoided for other reasons such as heart failure, you want to teach your patient with COPD to drink at least two liters per day. Also humidification for those living in a dry climate or hospital airs definitely um, does not contain a lot of moisture so making sure they have humidification on their oxygen or humidifier in the room. And those for who use dry heat during the winter would also benefit from a cool mist humidifier at home. We talked about the working breathing that raises your caloric needs, protein needs. Um, usually they're deficient and um, malnourished. Um, they tend to not want to eat because the shortness of breath is exacerbated or interferes with eating. So we want to teach them to um, patients to have their biggest meal of the day um, in the time frame that they're most hungry and well rested. Um, more corporation is to have four to six small meals um, versus three large ones. Infection prevention, making sure our patients know hand hygiene, avoiding crowds, um, stress the importance of receiving recommended pneumonia vaccines, yearly influenza vaccines, and up-to-date on their COVID vaccines. Next, we will discuss drug therapy to aid in improving gas exchange. The goal of the drug therapy is to delay progression, promote continued activity tolerance. In upcoming slides, I'll review um, drug classes with you, their mechanism of action in patient education. Um, your COPD patient most likely may be taking systemic agents in addition to inhaled agents. Um, really, their response to therapy is the best indicator. So again, assessing their dyspnea, the degree of dyspnea after um, new interventions or medications 
medications have been added. Um, drugs can either be stepped up um, or stepped down, depending on disease exacerbations um, and patient report of improvement in symptoms. Very important that you're familiar with Table 24.1, common examples of drug therapy. Um, it goes back to the asthma section of your text, but the treatments are similar for both. So that's the reason we're going to utilize it in our COPD um, disease process. So looking at your short-acting beta-2 agonist, these provide rapid but short-term relief. Um, so these drugs are useful when an attack begins. So as relief, um, they are utilized. They are not utilized as prevention strategies. Okay. Um, maybe your patient may need the pre-medication if they're about to begin an activity that usually induces an attack or makes symptoms worse. Agents here include albuterol. The other group um, I want to bring out to you on this chart is um, theophylline and aminophylline. Um, this is becoming rarer as we've gotten um, newer drugs that come with less side effects, but this is oral medication. Um, it's typically not in indicated for your CBD patients until they have severe advanced disease and other management has been effective. The reason for this is their systemic effect of these drugs. Um, there can be ineffective clearance of the drug, so you have to be close. Um, monitoring of their dosage, um, very many dangerous side effects. Your patient has to know that they have to follow up for therapeutic ranges. Here's additional drugs. So you have your corticosteroids. Um, goal of the corticosteroids is to decrease um, inflammation. Um, these can be administered Flucazole is probably bucemide, two of the most common ones I hear taught. It's very important that patients are meticulous about their oral care with the utilization of the corticosteroids, so assessing their mouth daily for lesions. Um, we're reducing a local immune response here, increasing the risk for local infections, especially yeast infections, so making that a high priority of your oral um, assessment. They may be on systemic um, prednisone to help reduce uh, inflammation as well, so again, the immune effects here, making sure they do not suddenly stop taking this drug. They um, titrate down when they've been on it for a long term, letting them know the risk um, related to bone health, um, increased risk of GI ulceration. We talked about that in previous modules with prednisone. Um, chromalin, this um, is to help stabilize mast cells, reduce the risk of inflammatory mediators. So goal here too is um, decrease attacks that may be triggered by inflammation. This is not um, a relief therapy. This drug has to be taken daily. So making sure your patient knows even when it's a good day and their symptoms are well controlled or they're saying they're not having any symptoms, they're still taking this. Um, effectiveness is required, um, requires continuous use. Um, teach them about the inhaler maintenance, um, and again, not to be used as a relief drug. Um, you have to make sure this is used on a daily basis. The Lucatree modifiers, um, main drug in this class is your Singulair, blocks the Lucatree receptor preventing inflammation, um, both useful in COPD and asthma. Teach patients, same thing here, this is a daily drug, even when symptoms are not present, maximum effect comes from daily use. Home care management, reinforced techniques of purslip breathing, um, abdominal breathing, positioning, relaxation therapy, how to conserve energy, um, coughing, deep breathing um, may require a lot of coordination of your home care staff as well who are making assessments, seeing any changes in their presentation that's increasing the risk of the complications we discussed earlier, making sure they're um, confident in their drug therapy, how to use them, is it preventative every day or is it rescue therapy? Planning outcomes. We want to make sure our COPD patients are able to attain and maintain gas exchange at a level with their baseline values, achieve an effective breathing pattern that increases the work of breathing. They're able to maintain a patent airway, adequate body weight, um, decreased anxiety, feel more empowered to manage their disease and its progression, increased activity um, that's acceptable to him or her. And if not, if they're not able to complete their ADLs, can we assess their dyspnea um, and advocate for care um, or assistance they may need at home? And then how to avoid serious um, complications including respiratory infections.
Your artery hypertension, this is page 561 of your text. Um, pulmonary vessels and other lung tissue, this is um, undergo growth changes um, due to greatly increased pressure in the lung circulatory system for unknown reasons. Um, pulmonary hypertension, this is a chronic issue. Um, pressure which makes the right side of the heart work much harder okay um, normally this pulmonary vascular pressure is low it's exchanges between the right side of the heart and lungs um, the if you look at the muscle of the right um, ventricle compared to the left it's much smaller um, over time as it experiences higher lung vascular pressures that muscle is going to become enlarged um, and thickened is not helpful in circulation i'm um, going to lead to right-sided heart failure heart failure many lung problems including the one we just talked about copd and um, we will talk about pulmonary fibrosis um, tends to be one of the main reasons that a client will develop pulmonary artery hypertension diagnosis is made usually from a right-sided heart cath where they're using a tip on the end of that catheter that is directly measuring the pressures within um, the pulmonary artery system drug therapy then is used to reduce pulmonary pressures um, and try to slow or combat the progression of right-sided heart failure by aiding in dilation of pulmonary vessels um, preventing clot formation okay um, usually they are on an anticoagulant such as warfarin or coumadin and they have to maintain um, therapeutic INR windows of 1.5 to 2 and have to be um, aware of dietary recommendations, um, adverse interactions with other drugs, and then calcium channel blockers um, help dilate vessels, kind of reduce the pressure in that vascular system and allow for easier flow. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this is page 552 of your text. Um, this is a restrictive lung disease, usually an older adult, um, may have some history of cigarette smoking, chronic exposure to inhalation irritants, um, but also drug therapy, amarodrone, that we'll talk about as an antiarrhythmic drug in 2930, is known um, for having to have tight windows of drug therapy and toxicity leading to possible development of pulmonary pulmonary fibrosis. Onset is usually slow. Um, early in symptoms include mild dyspnea on exertion. As this fibrosis progresses, the patient's going to have more short of breath. Hypoxia is going to become severe, likely going to need high levels of oxygen therapy, and will unfortunately still remain hypoxic on high levels. Respirations are shallow um, and rapid. So fibrosis, we're thinking thickening, hardened. Um, our lungs should inflate easily. They should be elastic. Um, and in pulmonary fibrosis, the progression is that they are not. Um, even those um, that tend to respond to therapy, unfortunately, due to the natural progression of this disease, um, the complication, it leads to um, death by respiratory failure. Lung transplant plant is a curative for um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. However, due to limited of um, donor, donor lung, selective criteria that the client has to meet, um, cost, availability, um, it really makes it um, unlikely for most patients to be able to receive a lung transplant in time. A lot of teaching here about how to utilize their oxygen, same thing, energy conservation, drug therapy. Uh, you can imagine that fatigue is very frustrating here, the shortness of breath. Um, so making sure we advocate um, for how they manage this best as possible. Lung cancer begins on 562 of your text. Um, primary lung cancers arise as a result of failure of our immune system to regulate abnormal cell growth in the bronchial epithelium. There is a um, poor long-term survival rate associated with lung cancer, fortunately also diagnosed at a late stage when metastasis is present. Um, we'll talk about in upcoming slides how we're trying to be more on the offense of this with some effective screening strategies. Most lung cancers 
can be classified as small cell or non-small cell. Um, non-small cell have several subtypes that are managed in different ways, um, depending on causes and location within the lungs. Metastasis, again, this is spread of this cancer of origin, usually occurs by its direct access, so highly vascular um, respiratory system, and then invading um, subsequential lymph nodes and glands and vessels. The concern here is these tumors usually, as they grow, um, they obstruct bronchioles partially or fully, and therefore we now have an interference um, with gas exchange. Staging of cancer is performed to assess the size and extent of the disease, um, and then with higher stages being associated with, higher numbers being associated with later stages and less chance for cure or long-term survival. Incident prevalence, so risk factors here, repeated exposure to inhaled substances that cause chronic irritation and inflammation. Cigarette smoking is our major risk factor responsible for 81% of all lung cancer deaths. Non-smokers exposed to secondhand smoke and third-hand smoke have risk. Again, the chronic exposure to chemical and irritants um, sometimes occur in adults who've never smoked. We seem to find this correlation more in the female gender. Health promotion, so primary prevention strategies for lung cancer is directly related to smoking sensation strategies, um, supporting your patient, providing them with information on those techniques. Secondary prevention is by early detection, um, screening adults at high risk for lung cancer development. There's a lot of advocation now for um, annual CT scans um, to detect cancer earlier when cure is more probable as well as long-term survival. Now let's discuss some um, warning signs here. There is a box in your book, table 24.8, page 564. Warning signs associated with lung cancer. This includes hoarseness, changes in respiratory pattern, persistent cough, blood streak sputum, rust-colored sputum, um, frank hemoxysis, chest pain, chest tightness, um, reoccurring episodes of pneumonia or bronchitis that's not related to an infectious origin, shortness of breath, um, fever, and this is more um, due to chronic inflammation in response to the cancer itself, wheezing, weight loss, um, clubbing. Diagnostic assessment, the definite diagnosis of lung cancer is made by examination of cancer cells from biopsy or from a pleural fusion um, assessment. Additional images um, may also include MRI, um, PET scan, radioactive nucleoside scans. This is get an idea of characteristics of the tumor and assess for metastasis. Okay, so I'm going to take you back to previous chapter, chapter 22, um, page 512, to assess um, for the diagnostic in relation to lung cancer of a lung biopsy. Um, this can be done with um, transbronchial biopsy um, or transbronchial needle biopsy. Um, these would both be performed during a bronchoscopy. And then there's needle aspiration that's performed to the skin, so percutaneous, for areas that can't be reached by bronchoscope. Um, refer back to chapter 9 for the surgical um, interventions. We'll talk about some of these in lecture. Be prepared to name these preparations for your patient. The main complication of this lung biopsy is going to be a pneumothorax. Um, reports um, most commonly when concerned about a pneumothorax postoperatively when caring for someone who's had a lung biopsy is noting reduced or absent breath sounds. Um, also want to monitor for um, coughing up scant or transient amounts of blood. Same thing, very vascular organ system, so can be letting us know that there's some hemorrhage concerns. Now, how is lung cancer managed? There's some non-surgical management that includes chemo, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, radiation therapy. Um, chemotherapy is often the treatment of choice for lung cancers, especially the small cell lung cancer. Can be used alone or as add-on or um, therapy in combination with, with surgery. Um, radiation therapy can be effective for locally advanced um, lung cancers that are confined to the chest, um, but most commonly it's going to be combined with chemotherapy. 
may be utilized before surgery to shrink the tumor size and make resection of that tumor easier. Immunotherapy for lung cancer is um, a type of targeted therapy designed to allow the patient's own immune system to be allowed to recognize and attack the, own, the specific cancer cells. So it's utilizing our immune system um, to attack the abnormal cells. Surgical management of lung cancer can include a lobectomy um, or just a wedge resection or complete pneumonectomy, which is complete removal of the lung. Um, total tumor removal can result in cure um, if complete resection is possible. Um, if it's not possible, they're going to try to remove the bulk of the tumor. Again, can remove just the tumor itself, removal of a lung section, removal of the lobe, the lobectomy, or remover of that in, entire lung. Pre-op care um, is a lot of teaching about the potential placement for a chest tube. And we're going to talk extensively about um, what it is, why it's done, and how to care for our patient with a chest tube. Um, Post-op care for who have gone um, and had one of these um, surgical managements of their lung cancer tumor um, will usually require a closed chest drainage system. Not only drain the air if we're concerned about attention to thorax, but even blood and fluid um, that can collect in that pleural space as a result of the tumor itself. Here talking about chest tube placement, you can see different sites here for air versus blood drainage system. Um, the goal with the placement of the chest tube is to allow for lung re-expansion, um, prevent air and fluid from returning um, there. The goal of the re-expansion is that our lung works under a negative pressure system. And so um, when it has collapsed, there needs to be a re-expansion chest tube system applied um, with some pressure pressure and suction that allows for re-expansion or the same sense of a vacuum re-expansion for our lung. The tip of the tube can be uh, used again um, to drain air or fluid or blood or pus um, that's coagulated into the lung. Um, usually if it's draining the liquid then it's at the side nearest the base of the lung versus the air is more front apex of the of it um, the wounds are covered with an airtight dressing most commonly in a like silicone foam form Let's talk a little about chest tubes and chest tube care. Chest tubes aren't placed in the lungs, but in the pleural space. Um, this is the space between the parietal and visceral pleura. The parietal or outer pleural covers the chest wall and the diaphragm. It does contain a small amount of serous fluid that coats um, the opposing surfaces. This allows the visceral and parietal pleura to guide over each other without friction. If there was a breach in the pleural integrity, um, this would create a separation between the parietal and visceral pleura, allowing air or fluid to fill this space. If this was to happen, your visceral pleura would collapse inward along with the lungs and the parietal pleura would recoil outward along with the chest wall. Attention pneumothorax could possibly develop. This is a condition um, that occurs when the injured tissue forms a one-way vowel or flap, which is a, allowing air to enter this pleural space, preventing it from escaping naturally. Um, this is seen mainly with um, thoracic trauma and line placement also is um, a major complication of a lung biopsy. This could rapidly progress to respiratory inefficiency, cardiovascular collapse, and ultimately death if unrexed unrecognized and untreated. We'll talk about some signs and symptoms to monitor for. In upcoming slides, it requires immediate life-threatening treatment by inserting um, a needle to relieve pressure, um, followed by a chest tube insertion. One or more chest tubes may be inserted into the medial stinum to drain blood and prevent cardiac tamponade. The overall goal of chest tube therapy or chest tube care is to promote this lung to re-expand, re-extore adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and prevent further complications. So we want to remove air and fluid as promptly as possible to allow for the lung to re-expand, and then preventing drained air and fluid from returning to the pleural space. We'll talk about how the chest tube functions in this way. And then allowing for restoration of the negative pressure within the pleural space so we can re expand that lung. 
So when preparing for chest tube insertion, you want to prepare um, the practitioner will may administer a local anesthetic along with a sedative um, to aid um, in patient comfort. The sizing and equipment um, is similar in the French sizing for other devices. So the larger the size, the actually smaller the tube is. Generally, larger tubes are reserved to drain blood and um, fluid, while smaller tubes are used for air removal. Your patient positioning for chest tube insertion, generally the patient is uh, positioned flat with a small wedge, um, several folded towels or blankets placed under the shoulder blade to elevate the body and give the practitioner easier access. That arm on the side of the procedure of um, chest tube insertion must be kept out of the way. Usually this is brought over the patient's head um, and secured. Once the chest tube is in place, nursing care consists of at least every two hours documenting a comprehensive pulmonary assessment including respiratory rate, um, work of breathing, breath sounds, and arterial uh, oxygen hemoglobin saturation that's going to be measured by pulse ox. You can inspect that dressing and insertion site for any drainage. Also assessing for any subcutaneous tissue and this feels like um, crepitus under the skin um, and any migration of chest tube. We'll talk how to look for that with any visualization of eyelets on the tube. You want to keep all your tubing free of clinks, kinks and occlusions. Checking that it's not entrapped beneath the patient or pinch beneath the bed rails, take steps to prevent <coughs> fluid filled dependent loops which can impede drainage and keep um, increased pressure within the tubing. To promote drainage, you want to keep um, the chest um, drainage system below the level of the patient's chest. We'll talk about the water levels within the water seal and the suction control chambers. Um, we know water evaporates, so if you're utilizing um, a wet vac system and then also in the water seal, you want to make sure you add water periodically to maintain the water seal and suction levels. You want to watch for titling. Um, titling is fluctuations within the water seal chamber. With respiratory effort, this is normal. Um, the water level increases during spontaneous inspiration and decreases with expiration. If titling doesn't occur, you want to evaluate for a kink within your system um, or maybe a dependent tubing section has become filled with fluid. Um, but also, once the lung has completely re-expanded, is no longer collapsed, titling also stops. So that may be that um, a therapeutic outcome um, has been reached. You will note um, intermediate bubbling in the middle section. This is the water seal section. This corresponds to respirations, indicates an air leak from the pleural space. Um, this should resolve as that air is removed from the pleural space and not allowed to re-enter. However, if bubbling is continuous in the water seal problem, this is an issue. You need to suspect there's a leak in the system. This is a common um, nursing prioritization regarding safety. To, loca to loc um, locate the leak source, um, this could be from where there's a loose connection from the system to the site of insertion or from around the site itself. You have to begin to assess from the insertion site back to your chest drainage system. Um, when searching for an air leak, um, you want to have an order to search for this. This is when you would use rubber tipped or padded clamps to um, only for an instant clamp the tube at various points um, to assess for when bubble bubbling stops and when you've clamped it between the air leak and the water seal, the bubbling will stop. Um, if you clamp along the entire length of the chest tube and you can't find the source, meaning you get continuous bubbling, it might be the chest um, drainage system itself is faulty and must be replaced. But again, you're not going to be clamping this chest tube without an order. Okay. When assessing drainage for um, the chest tube system, you want to, at regular intervals, at least every eight hours, document the amount of drainage and its characteristics. You want to report sudden fluctuations or change in chest tube output, especially a sudden increase from previous or changes in characteristics um, of such as like it was bright red um, or free flowing red drainage, which could indicate hemorrhage and was changed from previous drainage. Nursing care does not include to milk strip or clamp the chest tube for chest tube care. Um, in the event um, of chest tube disconnection, you would want to submerge um, the chest tube that's connected to the patient in one to two inches um, of 
sterile water or saline solution that's 250 milliliters in volume until you're awaiting the setup of a new chest tube system. This establishes a water seal. So therefore, air um, is allowed to continue to escape, but air is not allowed to re-enter into the pleural space. Chest tube removal um, is considered when there's improvement in respiratory status. You see um, symmetrical rise and fall of the chest. You have bilateral breast sounds. There's been decreased chest tube drainage, absence of bubbling in the water seal during expiration. Remember, if this intermittent bubbling has resolved, um, the lung may have spontaneously re-expanded and there's been improved chest x-ray findings. It's important to advocate that the patient is pre-medicated to um, relieve pain and ease anxiety. Okay, Your instruction will usually include as a nurse that you're discussing um, how to perform a Valsalva maneuver um, when he or she performs the practitioner removes the tube. Um, this is to prevent air from re-entering the space. Immediately after chest tube removal, you're going to want to apply an occlusive dressing to the site and secure it with tape. Another chest x-ray is usually done after and then several hours after to ensure that the lung is remaining fully inflated. Um, nursing care at this point will include ongoing respiratory assessment, vital sign documentation, and monitoring the site and as well as the patient's comfort level. Okay, now we're going to talk about the two different systems. The one on your left is a wet um, suction chest tube drainage system. The one on the right is a dry suction chest tube drainage system. We'll talk about some similarities and what sets them apart. So your chest tube will have, um, both will have a drainage collection chamber. This is the first chamber um, where you will collect blood or fluid. The second or middle chamber is the same for each system. This is the water seal chamber to prevent air from moving back up the tubing system and into the chest. The third chamber is what sets these systems apart. This is the suction chamber, suction regulator. Um, in chamber one, again, this is similar for both, um, the drainage, um, fill must never reach the point where it comes into contact with any tubes. So if you note that you have your three columns are getting full, then you want to request um, a new drainage system because if that fluid starts to meet the tubing that's connected to the patient, it may cause increased pressure, inability for fluid to be removed, and then increase the risk of attention pneumothorax. Chamber two is the water seal. Both chambers have this, or sorry, both systems have this. This prevents air from re-entering the patient's pleural space. As air leaves the pleural space, it will pass through chamber one, which is the collection chamber. And then as it goes to chamber two, it's gonna hit the water seal, um, and that's gonna prevent um, the, the air from going back to the patient. So it's gonna be escaped in the water seal as bubbles, but then it's trapped and cannot return to your patient. So it's a one-way bowel. Um, Bubbling in the water seal indicates um, air drainage. Um, this should be intermittent, occur when the patient's coughing, talking, um, exhalation, and sneezing. When all the air has been removed, um, bubbling will stop, um, but you also want to assess for a kink in your system because a blocked or kinked chest tube will also stop bubbling. If you have excessive bubbling in the water or continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber, this may indicate an air leak. So this is when you have to assess um, the tube for air leaks. And you want to make sure in the water chill seal chamber you're um, keeping that minimal amount of water of two centimeters to maintain the water seal. You may see in the water seal area that it rises two to four inches during inhalation and then falls during exhalation. This is called tidling, um, is normal, um, tends to stop once the lung has re-expanded. Going back to chamber three, which differentiates the two systems, you have the wet suction and dry suction. Um, with wet suction, the fluid level in chamber three is prescribed by the surgeon. This is connected to wall suction um, and will have gentle bubbling in the suction chamber only. So that is an anticipated finding that your chest tube system is being therapeutic by applying negative pressure to allow for re-expansion of the lung. Okay. Um, if you don't have bubbling and you, and you have a wet system that is connected to suction, you then should be assessing that suction is on and checking for any air leaks to suction. When dry suction is prescribed on the device, that's the device on the right here on the slide, um, 
the regulator is set to the amount of suction prescribed by the surgeon, and you're going to see um, there at E on the chest tube, the letter E, there's an orange bellow that will inflate, letting you know that suction has been applied. Most commonly, it's negative 20 is where it will be set at. Um, looking at a little a few more differences with the wet system as well. That height of water will indicate suction. Um, so making sure you maintain the height most commonly, that's negative 20 um, centimeters of H2O to make sure that you maintain what has been ordered by the surgeon for application of suction. Now we will review um, best practice for patients regarding chest tube drainage system from your book, box 24.9. You want to ensure that the dressing on the chest um, around the tube is tight and intact. Reinforce or change per surgeon or agency policy. For respiratory assessment, assess for any difficulty breathing, breathing effectiveness by pulse oximetry, what's their O2 sat, listening to see how breath sounds are, if they're improving with the application of the chest tube drainage system, and check for tracheal alignment. Any deviation of uh, the trachea could also be indications of attention in the thorax. You want to check the insertion site, palpate the skin, see if you um, note any crepitus. Um, areas of um, puffiness or cracking that may indicate subcutaneous emphysema. Also observing for signs of infection, redness, purulent drainage, or excessive bleeding. You want to assess to see if the tube eyelets are visible. They should not be. Um, this is the eyelets that are within the tube that allow fluid, air, or blood to drain. If eyelets are visible, that means your chest tube has been dislodged. Um, always assessing for pain and intensity, administering drugs as needed to, to control pain. Encouraging your patient to cough, deep breathe, um, use their incentive barometer, and then um, splint with, with movement and coughing. Um, encourage repositioning with the patient. Now, the drainage system, we've already talked, we do not strip the chest tube um, or use a milking motion um, without orders and indications for that to be done. You want to keep the drainage system lower than the level of the patient's chest. Um, keep the chest tube as straight as possible from the bed to the suction unit. You do not want any kinks or dependent loops. Ensure that the chest tube is securely taped. Usually you'll see additional tape connections made around the connector from the drainage system to the patient. And this is try to prevent air leaks. You want to assess for bubbling in the water seal. This should be gentle bubbling, gentle intermittent bubbling only on patients, exhalation, forceful coughing, position changes, sneezing, talking. If you've got continuous bubbling or vigorous bubbling in the water seal, you need to be assessing for a leak. You want to assess for toddling. This is the rise and fall um, in the water seal chamber with breathing. This is expected, should increase with um, expiration and then fall with exhalation. Make sure you maintain um, the water seal chamber at the adequate level, usually two centimeters. And then make sure um, to check the water level if you're using wet suction chambers at the prescribed surgeons. Usually this is 20 centimeters. Your table talks about clamping the chest tube for brief periods. I encourage you to only do this with order and with indications. Um, if you feel there's a leak you cannot identify um, within the system or if you have a faulty system. You want to document the amount, color, characteristics of fluid. Notify surgeon or team if there's changes, increased amounts, changes in color. Now the trachea deviation from midline is your first box that talks about um, when to notify surgeon or rapid response. That is crucial that you constantly, when you're assessing breast sounds, you're assessing for any tracheal deviation, increased symptoms, DSATs, um, increased drainage. Both all of the first three bullets there are concerning for tension in thorax, and the last one being um, hemorrhage. Visible eyelets on the chest tube is going to be concerning for chest tube dislodgement. Now, if your chest tube does fall out, come disconnected from the patient, you want to first cover that area with an occlusive, dry, sterile gall, usually taped on three sides or connected on three sides. Um, and then you want to take the end of that chest tube um, that's connected to your patient and place that in 250 milliliters of um, sterile water or sterile normal saline, and that's to establish a water seal while we're reassessing or getting a new system.